So with only nine minutes delay, so that's a new record for us. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our good colleague from uh, uh, our well, friendly group by Viktor Lipitsky from Skaltech. Uh, and Dmitry will present uh, joint results by him and by Victor about uh, artistic style. So probably he will tell us about the, the, the concept of, of artistic style, which was uh, suggested uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Well, a year and two months ago. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then and later was improved by uh, Dmitry and Victor, and the results were uh, reported at uh, a recent uh, international conference on machine learning. So uh, probably that's quite interesting, both uh, mathematically and uh, Conceptually, because this is a new area of, of uh, application of deep learning methods. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, I assume everybody knows about neural networks, but to, to be on the same way, uh, I will mention VGG style networks that were actually trained for classification 1000 classes. Uh, they performed very well, and uh, basically, they consist of Convolutions, non-linearities, and max poolings, and they were repeated. And then there are some fully connected layers in there and a soft max. But basically, we will uh, use only this part of the network. So this network will never be fine-tuned or trained or whatever. We will just take this network and use it. Well, not we, but I mean also we. But uh, everywhere in my talk, we will not uh, train the weights of this network. But we will use it. So, and when I say take an, uh, the activations at a certain layer, I will refer to this three dimensional tensor of size h by width by number of channels. Or, you know, depending on the framework, it can be like number of channels by width by h or whatever, but uh, it's always three dimensional tensor. So, one recent realization is that. In neural networks, especially the retrained ones, they can be used for generating images, not only for you know discriminative tasks like classification and detection, but also for generation. And uh, you probably heard of uh, Deep Dream. Two years ago, uh, a guy from Google he decided to maximize a certain neural activations inside the neural network and to generate an image that kind of maximizes these activations. And you get something like that, and uh, sometimes it's creepy, and that's probably why people loved it. And uh, that's, I think, that was uh, the first prominent project uh, using neural networks for generating images. And, and then, the output, at, at what layer did he maximize? The last uh, layer or not, some not, intermediate? Not the last one, but they uh, just took a pre-trained network and took like uh, a layer in, in the middle, not especially the last one. And they tried to maximize all the activations. All the activations? Well, not only one, let's say, but all of them. And they have got something like that? Yes. yes. This is like a picture. Uh, so no, probably they have taken picture and uh, then started modifying it. Yes, in order to maximize some activations inside of the neural network. So the initial picture probably was uh, these two deers? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, should be. Uh, switch the lights off yes. because I have a lot of uh, images in there. <coughs> okay. So, uh, another work on generating images was uh, by Simana, and uh, they actually tried to maximize a certain activation, one activation at a time. So, you can, for example, have a neural network which has, uh, which can discriminate gooses. Geese, goosey, from, from <laughs> others, right? And then you can try to generate an image that has like a probability one to be a goose, and you kind of get something like that if you do that. So this is the most goose. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. You kind of maximize the gooseness. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, and basically, most importantly for us, neural networks can be used for texture synthesis, image style transfer, and neural doodles. So, I will first review what they are, 
and then we will describe. Uh, I will describe our recent work, which made uh, existing methods scalable and uh, applicable to real applications. So, okay, what is texture synthesis? <coughs> you are given only one example of a texture, and you are to synthesize more examples. And basically, uh, there is a problem. I mean, even I, as a human, I cannot define like why these two pictures belong to the same textures, a texture class. Why do they, like, why, why are they uh, samples from one texture? But probably, you know, intuitively I can say that, okay, they contain, they both contain stones, and that is why. So, you can say that, okay, so probably you need to preserve some local properties of this image, yeah, in the synthesized uh, example. But still, you can discard some, you know, global information, some spatial information. Like you, you don't care where uh, the stones are located. So you can actually efficiently sh shuffle uh, the stones, and that will be a synthesized image. So the algorithm uh, proposed by the University of Tübingen actually uh, intelligently shuffles the image, preserving some local structure. But in fact, if you, your initial image has some uh, global structure, like we know that the text should be aligned, right? Then it will still shuffle all the, <coughs> all the way around, and uh, the global structure will not be preserved at all. So next, we have uh, artistic style transfer. It's quite easy, right? You have um, the content. same authors. Huh? Is it the same authors? Sorry? Authors, authors, are they yes, the yes, same? Exactly. So uh, they first proposed uh, texture generation um, algorithm. <coughs> it was published at NIPS, I think. Like uh, they submitted it in in May, right? Mm -hmm. like the deadline and uploaded to archive. And then uh, in the late August, they uh, uploaded another work, which actually extended the texture synthesis. So this is a good example of how to to, to create multiple. Uh, purpose on top conferences. Yes, exactly. The and, uh, <laughs> CDPR, they of course had an uh, oral talk, and uh, before publishing it, they also uh, issued a patent. So it was quite clever. Smart guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, in artistic style transfer, you have a style image, you have a content image, and you want to transfer a style uh, on your content image and basically get something like that. This is just another example. <laughs> it's a real examples of this algorithm. I will describe the algorithm a bit later. And uh, another fun application is neural doodles. So you have a template image, and you have a mask defined for this temple, template image. <coughs> and what you can do next, you can redefine your mask, and then resynthesize your image accordingly to this mask. And where did you get the first mask? The ground truth. Oh, you need to draw it your hand, but by your hand, yes. So, um, this was actually first created by Alex uh, Champara, but uh, I will not describe his algorithm. But, um, well, you, you can do it in uh, the framework of texture synthesis and style transfer, and he did it a little bit differently. So, okay. What do you need to generate an image? You need a loss function, which can score an arbitrary image and tell how close this image is to a desired one, right? So if you have this kind of loss function, then you can minimize it. And if it is a good loss function, then you probably can do it by gradient descent, right? So you can start from a noisy image, like an image that contains only noise, and then gradually optimize it, and eventually get an example of your texture or stylized image depending on the loss function. So the only problem is how to define a loss function for your particular task. Uh, and uh, what these guys from Tübingen proposed is to do the following way. So you take a VGG network with a fixed weight. Okay, we are discussing texture synthesis right now. So you get it, uh, you take a texture, you pass it through the network, and you are obtain an activation set some layers. And then uh, you take these activations and you calculate kind of uh, correlations between the feature maps. 
So for example, the activation of this, this layer, uh, okay, assume you have 512 convolutions on this layer, then your activation is of, of size 512 by height by width, and then you calculate the uh, correlation between uh, feature maps. And these correlations, that are usually called gram matches, is of size 512 by 512, where height j element is a correlation between height and j feature map. Uh, what is t here? <coughs> oh, it's a texture. Ah. So th this is just input? Uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat again what is VDV 19? Oh, okay. So uh, basically, there are plenty of networks trained on the ImageNet database to classify cats, dogs, and cubs, and uh, giraffes, and so on. And uh, VGG 19 is one of these networks. So it takes an image as an input and outputs a probability of belonging to 1,000 classes. Yeah. And it has a structure of like convolutions, convolutions, convolutions with the down sampling operators inside and then fully connected layers and so of So, uh, And how do we select the, the, the layer? Uh, it's an interesting question. So <coughs> basically uh, for texture synthesis you just select every layer because um, if you think of what information captures, let's say, first layer? It captures a local information about like regions, like uh, of size, uh, the receptive filter at this layer by receptive filter at this layer, right? Because, let's say first layer, it uh, only sees like uh, three by three patches. But then, if you compute the correlations, it will be kind of local information about three by three patches. And then, as you go through the network, you down sample, and then the receptive field of these neurons. They, uh, is quite large, and then this gram matrix kind of stores the information about huge regions. So you basically want uh, to um, all, all of these layers included in your layer set because you want to capture information at different uh, different different scales. Okay, so. Let's continue with the algorithm. So, okay, you, you take a texture, you calculate these correlation masks at some layers, and what you do next, you just store these uh, gram matrices for your texture example. And then you start with the random image X, you pass it through the network VGG, and then you obtain a gram matrices for the same layers. And then you basically compare the gram matrices you obtained with the gram matrices you stored. And that basically your loss function. I mean, it's just a sum of individual components at each layer. So uh, we, uh, we've defined the loss function, right? Then we can minimize it. And it's really easy because it's uh, differentiable. Because you can compute uh, your loss in forward pass and then do a backward pass to compute a gradient with respect to the x. x. And what will happen if we start not from a random image, but from some predefined image? No problem. The result will be different. But will it uh, be a bit, uh, will it a bit uh, look like uh, the initial image? For example, we start from, uh, say, the image of, of gooses, and we try to, 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 to produce this stone-like texture. And then um, we'll, we'll, we'll end up with some gooses uh, with stone-like stone te okay. texture. I think, okay, if, if you do, like, infinite number of iterations, it will not. But if you do a fixed number of iterations, depending on your learning rate, you might have some you know, uh, patterns uh, from initial image, right? Like, you, you didn't optimize it sufficiently. Uh, yes, but we may suffer from local extrema, which is inevitable when we use gradient distance schemes. Yes, okay, okay, uh, it may happen, right? People say that you don't really have many local minima in high dimensional spaces. It's mostly about several points. No, it's, it's about neural networks, but we not, do not optimize neural networks yes. here. And basically, for this loss okay. function, you have like a lot of local minimums. Well, how many parameters do you have? The number of oh, pixels? Oh, the size of the image, right? The number of pixels. Uh, okay. you, you, you have a lot because this function uh, basically, by definition, lets you to shuffle the pat uh, patches and still have uh, yeah. low loss value, right? 
why why have you choose a particular ground matrix and this kind of flows in the choices seems up. So okay, so not my choice, it's uh yeah, okay. choice by okay. So okay. And basically why do you want to have it kind Okay. What is the meaning of this ground matrix? You need uh, something to be a descriptor of your of your texture, and this descriptor should have uh, information about some local um, properties of your image, but should discard all the spatial information. So there are many ways to discard spatial information. For example, you can take an activation and then uh, do I don't know average pooling, or average over over the pixels, right? Or you can, uh, okay, average pooling corresponds to another type of descriptor when you uh, do not calculate the correlations, but you'd rather calculate the mean of each activation, right? It's just, you know, a step, step backward. So you can go for, uh, further, let's say, and uh, calculate not uh, the pairwise uh, correlations, but let's say uh, triple correlations and so on. It's just, you know, you just need to try what, ha what works for you. And uh, it happens that uh, this correlations works for already, so you don't need anything like more complicated and probably less complicated things work uh, work worse. Is there any intuition why, so they tried uh, just average activations and they failed for them and why did they think about the gray matrices? Is there an intuition why it's reasonable to compute correlations and not something else? Um, okay. Okay, let's, I, I can uh, tell another way of thinking about it. So, say your your activation tensor is of size. This is uh, height. This is width, and this is number of channels. So, okay, assume you have a data set of uh, this number of points. It's uh, W by H, and uh, they basically belong to this space. Yes. So mm -hmm. basically, you just well, this is your object. Yeah. And uh, you want to fit your data set into a distribution, and uh, namely, it will be <coughs> this distribution. So basically, uh, if you say that, then you need to estimate uh, the covariance, right? And this covariance is exactly the grand matrix. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure that they were thinking in this way, but uh, I'd rather think that they thought like, okay, we can try different uh, ways of eliminating the spatial information, and you can compute the mean of the activations, you can go further and uh, compute the second moment and so on. But here in this thinking, if you take a mean, you just uh, uh, get zero. It gives you nothing about the particular st uh, texture. Um, the mean, like, uh, parameterizing it with uh, this kind of thing? But you said that the, the minimum, mean here is almost similar to zero and you just need to estimate somehow covariance matters. No, 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 it's, it's not um, close to zero. Actually, I think it's not zero, but uh, they just used this kind of model for, for no reason, actually, because you, you can uh, say that, okay, instead of zero, we will use mean and here, why not? <laughs> I mean, in fact, they compute the grand matrices over the activations after uh, rectified linear units. So uh, every pixel in here is something that is greater than zero, then obviously the uh, mean is m greater than zero, right? I mean, it's, it's probably close to zero, but uh, still it's not zero. And yeah, a strange thing that they uh, fit the data that is strongly, like, that is not negative into the normal distribution, which is quite strange, right? So but they, it, it works. They do not estimate this mean and do yes. not uh, uh, normalize it, not center them. Yes, yes. So the, the, the grand matrix is not a covariance matrix. Yes, no, it's not. This is a shifted thing. Mm -hmm. Well, grand matrix is a covariance matrix uh, plus mu squared when mu is zero. Right? Yes, but here we 
know for sure that mean is not zero yes. because we use yes. real rule. Yes. Well, um, <laughs> you can do it in this way, right? You, you just will have uh, more parameters to estimate. But uh, let's say <laughs> when you estimate only one matrix, you have a uh, number of channels by number of channel parameters. And then if you add the uh, mu to that, we will have like number of channels by number of channels plus one, which is, I mean, not, not, not so much increase. But what is, the, what is the sense of establishing this Gaussian distribution? I still can't understand. Uh, is it just, well, a possible interpretation of what we're doing? Uh, I mean, I really do not think that authors were thinking in this way. Uh, and th th there is no w uh, reason to do that. Mm -hmm. You just need to um, fit into something and try it. I mean, uh, it, it happened to them that uh, this model worked. And you can say that, okay, it's uh, really, really simple, right? If you probably uh, fit into, I don't know, mixture of normal distributions or whatever, it will be better. But in fact, it is already sufficient. Uh, but what do you, do you mean when you say that uh, this model worked? Up to now, we know that uh, we are trying to minimize the difference between two germ matrices. Yes. They have nothing in common with normal distribution. <coughs> Okay, when you try to minimize the difference between normal distribution, you effectively uh, minimize the Kyle distance between two distributions, right? Yes. So exactly what, what they wanted to do is uh, to preserve the distribution that is at uh, different uh, scales, right? So, okay, let's think of that in this way. So what you want to do, uh, let's say first scale, you want a, a, a histograms over RGB channels to be the same at this and this image, right? Mm -hmm. like it should be grayish or something like that. Uh, so it's uh, the first layer and like, you want to fit the colors into a normal distribution, for example. Then you consider all the 3x3 three three regions and you say that, okay, the distributions of 3x3 three three patches on these images should be roughly equal. Then you go to 5x5, five 6x6 five, six six, and so on. And then you say that, okay, the distribution of this kind of, I mean, the big things should be roughly equal. Y you cannot uh, do it exactly equal, and uh, it happens that it converges to something visually good. Well, we understand that we should account for some statistics or data, but we yes. can't understand wh why okay. the gram matrix is actually chosen here, not so some it's, other It's thing. a particular choice by the authors. I mean, I, I cannot argue. No, but that's, that's reasonable. Because gram matrix captures some correlation, correlations between different channels. Well, uh, what, why not to take just correlations? But this is all, them almost the same. The uh, yes. Scalar products and, and correlation, this is, these are quite similar things. But the, the difference is... is the same things, no? It's, it, it would be the same thing if um, activations were centered at zero. Then they would be the same. But here the activations are not centered. Oh, you mean so they have non-zero okay, okay, mean, okay. yes. This is why this is not yes. the same thing, but they're still pretty similar. Yes. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, uh, the covariance uh, sort of uh, captures the dependence between different uh, patches, but the mean captures the content. Uh, in my opinion, the covariance is style and the mean is content. So if you don't account for this mean offset uh, device, uh, you will get kind of results that are dependent on the on your original content, on the content of style image. Mm, maybe, maybe. So I second Dmitry and Tandevich. I don't see why they don't use covariance matrix. Try it. Huh? Try to use uh, yes, I've tried them. Basically, there is no visual difference between using correlation metrics and uh, covariance metrics. So, okay. So, once again, in my opinion, you just need a certain type of descriptors that should um, deny all the spatial information, and many of them will work. But basically, okay. Probably the main thing why this kind of very very simple type of fit works is because of a complex structure of a neural network and uh, b because neural networks in, in this case it uh, kind of uh, serves as a prior over the 
over these uh, pixels. And it happens that these pixels are distributed in, this, in the way that uh, is really easy to fit in this distribution. So, okay. Now when you know how uh, texture synthesis work, you will probably guess how you do the neural doodles. Once again, you have a template image and you have a mask, right? And then user defines a new mask. And what we want to do is to synthesize a new image. So how would you implement it? Divide the image into parts mm -hmm. with different texture and uh, generate And perform texture synthesis for the particular yes, parts. Exactly, exactly. So you, you basically <coughs> capture five gram matrices for this image, right? One for the sky, one for the um, for the water, for the shore, and so on. And then you basically resynthesize image in corresponding regions. So here will be the sky, here will be the water, and so on. And uh, this is how it works. And uh, this is a real result, and it, it works quite well. Mm, interesting. Uh, don't you use some kind of uh, smoothening uh, loss that uh, would fix uh, edges between two different colors? Um, I suppose that if you, like in this case, it looks like every color uh, is, except maybe for dark red, every color is adjacent to every other color. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have uh, information about uh, how textures behave when they are on the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you didn't, uh, then that would probably cause some nasty <coughs> effects on the boundary. Yeah, that's true. So, basically, uh, okay, uh, for example, if you have uh, a sky at, at the top, right, and uh, the water at the bottom, you have naturally uh, the edge one, I mean, you have only one kind of edge, right, when the sky uh, at the top and the water at the bottom. Then if you Re redraw your mask in another way, like water here and the uh, sky is here. You've never seen an edge between the sky and uh, the water of that type. And that would cause uh, the optimization to drive crazy, actually. And it, because it never seen a edge like that, it will generate something grayish, uh, this kind of regions. That's right. So, uh, one of necessary conditions is that the user mask should have uh, sh should not be you know too different in terms of you know ratio ratios of uh, the, the edges okay. if compared to mask. So you shouldn't have new type of edges in your uh, user mask because you cannot handle. It. And it also breaks the global structure like shadows and stuff, right? Like yes, yes, of course. But, well, uh, you can notice that it has some sun over here, but not, let's say, over here. And that is probably because it's, it, it has seen this region, where you have only rock, but it uh, has the sun on it, and uh, all the way around the rock, there is only sky, so it just generated this kind of region. But and we can also <coughs> add additional regions which correspond to sunny part of the rock and which correspond to shadow. Yes. But then we'll, uh, we'll start approaching the real image closer and closer when we make our mask uh, more and more complicated. But you also uh, like, uh, lose the information, right? You need some, in uh, I mean, sufficient amount of information uh, to capture the style. So if your image also gets bigger as you divide your masks, mm -hmm. then probably you will be able to ca capture the information. That's right. I think I didn't get You said that it it saw that the rock is uh, like surrounded by sky, yes. and it can like infer something from it. But I thought yet that you're doing everything independently. Like you have the red region, and then mm -hmm. you feed the texture, and then you put inside the texture of well, the you, you do but it not consecutively, but you do it at the same time. And it happens that uh, basically when you do the optimization, let's say okay. the gram matrix captured uh, the uh, the sky gram matrix, it also has some information about the edges because. You cannot define the mask at uh, some middle layer of the network precisely, right? Because uh, you have a downside there. So 
the ground matrix of the sky will also have information about the connection to other uh, regions. And when you uh, kind of uh, optimize it uh, at the same time, then it, it happens that over the edges you converge to you know, uh, a good point. So, okay. Now uh, let's talk about style transfer. Basically, we understood that. Um, okay, let, let's think about style transfer in this way. We want to capture some local information about, uh, about the style and basically transfer it on the content. We want to capture, uh, I mean, we want to preserve the spatial information in the content, but uh, discard these local patterns and transfer them from a style. And local patterns, again, is like uh, the color, it's uh, the style of painting, basically. So we know how to transfer the local properties, it's uh, texture synthesis basically. So we should definitely have a part of the loss function uh, from texture synthesis. But then the problem is how, how do you define a second part of the loss function to preserve for spatial information. And basically you can do it in a really similar way. So you take your content image and you compute activations at some layers, they are probably different to the layers you had uh, when computing gram matrices. And again, you store this uh, activation. And then basically, during the optimization, you will match uh, the activations at this layer to the activations you've stored. So when optimizing, you have two parts of loss. You will uh, try to get an image that has uh, similar gram matrices to your style image and similar activations at your content image. Okay, uh, the similar questions, question is uh, what layers to use for content loss. So if you take uh, activations, let's say, at the first layer or even RGB, RGB layer, uh, no processing at all, then you, you probably cannot go uh, far from your initial image. Yes, because uh, <coughs> what you actually want to do, you want to go through the network and uh, preserve some information that is relevant to, uh, for, pro okay. Let me say it this way. So uh, why do we take a VGG as a feature extractor? Because it, it knows how to discard irrelevant information uh, during the forward pass. So in order to understand whether there is a cup or elephant on the image, you just need to discard all the irrelevant information and preserve some relevant information. So basically, uh, if you look at the features at uh, the middle of uh, the VGG, they will still have a lot of information about the in initial image, but uh, they also will discard a lot of information. So, uh, if you will try to preserve these kind of features that are deep inside the neural network, you will still uh, say that your image should be kind of similar spatially to your input image, but you do not say that it is uh, it should be similar equally in each pixel, right? So if, if you define your layer as the first layer, let's say RGB, then basically you uh, penalize for uh, equal deviance at each pixel. I mean, and if you define this loss function deep inside the neural network, probably you will have a different, uh, different loss for different semantic part patterns of your image. For example, you probably want to preserve edges better. And you, you probably want to discard some other information like flat regions because there is no information relevant to classification. So, uh, and in this case, what does this mean that uh, probably textures will be synthesized in this region and this uh, will, be, will be still preserved? I mean, uh, the parts with the great amount of edges, but still the edges will not get bl blurred and so on. I mean, it's really, again, hard to define what, uh, mathematically correct uh, explanation. Why should you take this layer or other layer, but intuitively you want to uh, preserve 
the features at some deep layer. But at, at least different layers have different shape, different number of elements within yes. it. So a layer, is, a layer with hi high number of, of parameters of nodes uh, would uh, uh, influence the most to this loss function. So you should uh, somehow normalize to normalize the course, yes. to the size of the layer. Yes. And to the to the depth of the layer and the number of channels. Mm, okay. Yes, of course. Uh, of course, there are some constants in here. No, 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 not not between two yeah, yeah, yeah. two here, losses, but yes, 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 yes. Yeah. The, there are plenty of hyperparameters you need to adjust. That's right. Whether you use normalization and uh, these parameters uh, and your these losses and so on, like the, the, there are a lot of them. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense to use, for example, assign distance instead of L two because two. Not to, not not to care about like multiplying the image by five or something. Yeah. Um, well, it will make sense, right? I mean, it's just what you said. And then uh, you will probably be able to generate uh, the image that will not have the same contrast as the style image. I mean, in terms of <laughs> if if you do cosine distance in uh, texture loss, then uh, you would say that your uh, probably synthesized image will be, you, you don't care how how uh, how much of contrast in there and how much of lightness in there, right? So, okay, is this clear, right? No, we use different sets of layers in different uh, losses, right? Uh, yes, but you can use the same <coughs> sets. I think what, again, what authors did, they just, uh, you know, started a brute force search and just tried all the combinations they could. Um, so, okay, the results are quite impressive, but in fact, uh, to generate one image, you need uh, five minutes using a top GPU. And, uh, Excuse me, uh, and for each image, you must to consider number of layers that we, uh, that we use. That we use. Yes, of course. But uh, you, if you uh, do not go deep in uh, deep inside the neural network, then uh, you will probably not be able to perform a good stylization. It is necessary to use the features from the players. So you really need to spend some time. And people also tried another uh, neural network like AlexNet or uh, ResNet and so on, and they perform quite differently. It depends on the structure and you cannot say that the features are worse, but in fact, for example, for AlexNet, when you have like 11 by 11 filters and uh, some severe max pooling, it happens that uh, optimization just produces visually bad images. And you cannot do anything with that. Like uh, there is a grid pattern or some noisy pattern. And it happened that uh, with, with the VGG, it, it works quite visually. So, okay, we tackled the problem of uh, the speed, and uh, that was our ICML work, texture networks. So, uh, what did we do? Okay, so in style transfer, and th this is more general actually than the style transfer, but uh, let's discuss it for style transfer and texture synthesis right now. So what we did, we, uh, I mean, not we, okay. What did the Tübingen University did? They defined a loss function and they tried to gradually minimize it. And uh, eventually they obtained a sample that is your texture, uh, texture example or your stylized image, right? So it takes time. What, what you can do, you can uh, basically use kind of a parameterization trick and uh, use a neural network to map an easy to draw distribution, let's say uniform, to uh, the local minimums of your, of your loss function. So basically, this neural network will take a noise as an input and will produce the images that will that correspond to a loss, low loss value. Yeah. So in, in fact, these arrows should point to x axis, and uh, these points are like L of G of Z. So G is a neural network; it takes noise and produces a sample which is already a texture example or stylized image. Does it 
wrote like a half of after encoder, like the encoder. Uh, sorry? Does this work like in part of the after encoder? Uh, can, can you elaborate? Oh, okay. So maybe you uh, okay, I will explain how it works and then if you have a question. So, basically, uh, but then if you have this neural network, then it's really easy, right? To generate a new image, you just need to sample from your easy-to-draw distribution already and uh, forward it to your neural network and obtain the sample. But it happens that uh, it's quite hard to solve this and uh, optimize with respect to the parameters. Mm -hmm. So for... Okay. Uh, you said that one uh, evaluation of G yes. is a solution, but there is, say, that we find minimum by... Uh, I, I wanted to point out that uh, every sample you get from uh, from uniform distribution will will map you into some local minimum of your loss function L hat. So to so solve this uh, problem for each image, or you need to solve this This limitation problem is right. Is it solved for every image? Um, okay, so you fix a texture. Mm -hmm. Te okay, let me go further. Okay. Uh, then, so, uh, how does it work for texture synthesis? So you have uh, a generated network in here, the loss function is defined in here, like in uh, previous slides. Uh, then, for training this network, you sample a bunch of uh, noise, and then you feed it to your network, which will generate in images, yeah, it will, it, it generates something for you, but then you can score it with your loss function, which can be a loss mm -hmm. function for texture synthesis or style transfer, then you can compute a gradient with respect to the X, which, which you actually did for optimization-based style transfer or texture synthesis, but then, instead of applying it, you can uh, forward it into uh, generate a network and compute uh, the gradients with respect to the parameters. So, basically, you can uh, optimize the weights in this way. Probably the trivial, trivial solution will be uh, to have a, an optimization-based method, just co collect a data set, and then try to build an autoencoder-like thing, right? But, in fact, it will not work, because uh, this function L of X basically has a lot of local minimums, and you cannot uh, define a deterministic function that will map any uh, any image to other image based on auto encoder because uh, like, uh, a lot of images will correspond to one input and uh, you will converge to a mean of this input. So, okay, and for style, uh, stylization, you'll just need to append your content image to your noise. So you just change an input for your generation uh, generator network, and you change the loss while training. Right? When testing, you just uh, remove this part, and you you already have a generator network, right? And why why didn't you put the texture also in the in the input channels, like you? Uh, okay, so uh, it's basically what I try to do now, but it, it doesn't work. Okay. I mean. Uh, when we started, uh, the results were quite bad, and basically the texture examples that we got from uh, the generator network were not that good to, you know, we, we couldn't even generate good images for one texture, right? And uh, it was too crazy to ask a neural network to uh, generate samples from an input texture, like for any texture, because we, we cannot do it for e even for one. But now I, I, I try it and it really doesn't work. So and do we, we train generate a network for each uh, content image for each texture image, but it takes a content image as an input. So uh, we train one image per style, but it can stylize any image, any content image. So uh, let's look at the example. So this is a texture image. Sorry, okay. you talked about the problem that it can collapse everything to, <coughs> to one texture. Yes. How? Uh, we can talk about it a little bit okay. later. I have a slide on it. And, uh, so, okay, this is a texture example. This is an optimization-based method, and this is ours. 
And in fact, uh, it's hard to see the difference, right? But the optimization phase take, takes a lot of time, and ours is like faster. So we are 500 times faster. So this is another example. This is a texture. This is optimization-based method, and uh, this is ours. And in fact, if you have a lot of diversity on your texture, it's really hard to capture it with one generator. So because you want your generator to generate diverse images every time when it sees a noise problem. <coughs> and it, it, it is quite hard. When you have a low diversity on your texture, then it's really easier for generator. And uh, probably you can do your generator just uh, deeper and uh, wider and so on, and it will work eventually, but in my case, it, the results were like that. So there are cases when uh, optimization-based method is better. But in fact, at, at least we are fast. So, uh, just more examples. And uh, again, one, if you cannot notice the difference between the columns, then synthesis works. Uh, stylization, this is a content image, this is a style, and this is the result of got install optimization-based method, and this is ours. <laughs> <laughs> really, people love it and creepy. So, uh, this is another style, and this is optimization-based method. This is ours, so it, it works. It, it it is really hard to say what is better in in, what, in which case. So let's say when I try to uh, train a network for some particular styles, it pers uh, produces some ugly results, but if you run an optimization-based method, it will still produce good results. So it really depends on the texture. For some reason, I mean, you, you cannot predict if this will work or it will not work, but uh, generally some some crazy, uh, like, impressive, not impressive, how it's called, uh, abstractism type of things like, like this will work good. So, Question? No? Okay. And this is just another example, and uh, I just wanted to point out that if you do the optimization, you, you can end up with this kind of regions, like uh, when the optimization preserved the content and didn't stylize it at all, and then it over stylized it in here. And you, so you some kind of <coughs> poor local excellence. Yes, yes. So you cannot uh, deal with that, or you probably can, but uh, in fact it happens. And, uh, if you train a network, the generating network, uh, for some reason, it produces better results in, in these terms. And again, I, I do not have a proof that it will never ha happen like situation like that. So, uh, about the example on the right, uh, okay. different generations all produce this effect, or different generations may produce or not produce. Yeah, if you start from different, uh, I mean, if you restart your optimization several times, like from different uh, initial points, then mm -hmm. you would probably converge to this kind of effect or, or not, but you cannot control it. Uh, Diman, is it possible to see uh, the results of your method uh, with different uh, random noise? Uh, to see how, how, how diverse is it? Okay, I had it in the uh, ICML presentation, but not in this one, but it's, it's really diverse and we do not collapse to one image, right? Mm -hmm. um, for stylization, actually, we collapse. I mean, I, I've never, I've, I've tried to append noise, uh, as I told on the previous slide, to the content image, but it happens that network really discards the noise. Mm -hmm. And uh, in case of texture synthesis, when you ha do not have a content at all, it, it pr produces uh, diversity. No, but this, I think, can be explained. Because for texture synthesis, uh, it is clear that yeah, the solution is not yeah. unique. But for uh, transfer st uh, style, Probably the solution should be more or less unique. Yes. Well, it's, it's not unique. Of course, you, again, you can stylize certain parts differently, but you do not need this noise, and you, you, you would better to discard it at all. Right? Yes. For network, it's easier. So, uh, one word on generator network. Basically, what we use is like fully convolutional neural network that consists only of convolutions. There's no fully connected layers at all, and uh, that is good because you basically can apply it to input image of any size 
yeah, while trained on, let's say, 256 by 256. Uh, but one thing, you should use this kind of instance normalization uh, layers instead of batch normalization. What is instance normalization? In batch normalization, you, you take a certain channel, this let's say, and uh, you take all the images in your batch, Mini and you batch. compute hmm? mini, mini, mini batch. batch, yes. And you compute mean and variance over this channel for each, uh, no, not for each, but <coughs> along the batch, the batch images, right? And you normalize, it. normalize, uh, let's say, first <laughs> map by this computed mean and variance. What you do in instant normalization, you just compute mean and variance for each map in each object. So, if you think uh, of insertion of batch normalization with batch size of one. It is exactly instance normalization. So, uh, but the mean is computed with respect to what? With respect to, to pixels? Uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But batch normalization doesn't work with batch size 1. It, it's no, 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 it works. I mean, special batch normalization. Oh, okay. Yes. So, exactly. for special batch normalization, you take uh, all the pixels in your channel and you average them. Okay. So, it's not zero. Um, yeah, and it happens that... So it's similar to layer normalization, actually. <laughs> yes, but in paper layer normalization, they told that it, it didn't work for them for convolutional layers. Yes, but for fully connected layers, it's, it's the same. And uh, in the layer normalization, uh, mean and variance is computed with respect to what? In layer Within one object, with respect to yes. features. To all channels in our fully connected layer? Well, in fully connected, I think. Well, the, actually, the they, they tried uh, a recurrent neural network. Uh, uh, but, okay, uh, for fully connected layer, just for one object across all the features, yes. So, but for, as a spatial wherein they proposed exactly this one. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Uh, it helps, and uh, the intuition why it helps is because. If you think of what, what image you should get after the stylization, it will, it, its contrast will not be dependent on your contact image, right? So if you would say use a black image as a uh, input or white image, uh, the output image will have roughly the same constant, contrast. And it means that your neural network should map uh, kind of any object to the normalized object, right? Because you basically want to discard the contrast of the image. You want to take the contrast of your style image and have it on your uh, stylized image, but not the uh, contrast of the content image. And we know that neural networks are almost, uh, you know, if you multiply the input by a number, then your output will roughly be multiplied by a number. So you don't want that to happen. So. Uh, neural network tries to learn this normalization, but it's really hard to do with the uh, convolutions and uh, this kind of stuff we usually use. So yeah. explicitly defining this um, contrast normalization helps. Do you apply this layer normalization about after each layer of the generator? Or what? Yes, I, I just substituted bus normalization with this instance normalization. Okay. So, okay, was it used somewhere? In fact, it was. So in Yandex, we've created this kind of demos verb <coughs> site uh, for some uh, neural networks article. Basically, the user could define its mask and would say, you remove the rock the starry night. <laughs> so, well, quite fun for some time. Probably we can do the same with Jaconda. To remove just woman. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, this technology was used in uh, Prisma app, which was quite popular in the summer. And uh, basically, they really started the they started and closed the era of uh, you know server side stylization, server side image processing. So the user uploaded uh, its image to their server, it, it was processed in there and returned as a stylized image. Uh, what did they did next, they uh, ported the neural networks, this uh, generator networks, uh, so they could uh, be executed on the device. So basically, they had uh, a huge uh, prices, 
bills for the servers, so they <laughs> were trying hard to optimize. And uh, uh, are you stay in contact with Prisma developers? Uh, I've, I've never been. I mean... So you don't know who are they? No, 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 I, I know exactly who, who they are, and basically they, uh, the head of them, like Alexei Maisenko, he contacted me uh, after uh, Prisma appeared, actually. So he, he told, like, let's work together. He, he told me, like, let's, uh, let's schedule a meeting. We schedule it, and then, like, one hour before the meeting, he told, like, I'm too tired, let's schedule it for tomorrow, and then he never appeared again. So, <laughs> okay. yes. Uh, but do you know uh, whether they use your results or not? Uh, yes, they use mine. I mean, it's, I, I mean uh, they have some code leakages and so on, and uh, I've seen my code in there. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's okay. It, it was open source, so... Uh, it but it's, usually it's open source for non-commercial purposes. Uh, it was and a, they, a patch license, because I, I, I didn't understand in anything in licenses, and I asked my... Uh, uh, my boss in Yandex, like, what license should I put? And he thought, like, take a license from uh, TensorFlow. And this was uh, not an open, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, there were quite a lot of uh, applica ap applications after Prisma here. Like, uh, this one is from vk.com, this is from mail.ru, and this one, another one. And uh, uh, basically, this one, did it for uh, videos, they kind of extended my algorithm and they, I mean, in their presentation they, uh, they say clearly they, that they use just my code from the GitHub. Uh, Prisma never does, but, uh, well, Vinci say, Vinci tell that. Uh, I can add, I think, two. Uh, and basically uh, there was another uh, paper that appeared like two weeks after after hours on archives, basically, and it is submitted to ECCV, which is uh, in Amsterdam right now, and uh, the ICML was in June already. So uh, there is a guy who are presenting the same thing, but because of this uh, you know, I, I archive uploading, and uh, we kind of, uh, how do you say that? We did it in the same time, and uh, I uploaded it like two months uh, after the deadline to ICML, and uh, he did it the same for ECCV. But uh, it was not copied at all. Uh, but uh, does he cite you? It is concurrent work. I mean, he should probably, because yes. my conference was well, but uh, no. No. <laughs> But, but actually, it is ethical if you, if you write him and, uh, will, and kindly ask him to, to cite you. He can refuse, of course, but this would be unethical for him. But let's say his deadline was before the ICMO, before my work was published. So but your work was published on archive, on archive before. Two days was it? Be before the ECCV deadline. <laughs> <laughs> I can't understand. So, okay, there was an ECCV deadline. Uh, yeah, yes, but and two days before that, I okay. my work. Anyway. Okay. Uh, he, he, um, at some point, uh, he submits camera ready version, and in his camera ready version, he could <laughs> cite you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Th that's true. Uh, so yeah, the source code is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can do the, another version. Uh, the we can follow Prisma, <laughs> contact him. Yes, uh, I can. So, Basically, okay, uh, that is all. And what, what I wanted to discuss, I mean, I have something uh, to discuss next. It's uh, the question by Alexander, basically. Uh, yes, this is actually the most interesting question. This one? Uh, about diversity. Yes, the diversity. So basically, uh, you can notice that minimizing this kind of thing uh, will lead you to for, uh, to generator g collapsing, right, and generating mm -hmm. kind of a global mini minimizer of your loss function. In, in ideal case. In ideal case, right. And you don't want that. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, let's try to derive why, and try to understand what, what are we doing there. So, uh, let's say our, we, we have uh, the distribution defined up to some normalizing constant, 
and this is defined like that. Yes, so uh, you can notice this L in there, and it's uh, we can think that this L of X, the loss function that we've defined for texture synthesis, is actually this L. And by uh, minimizing the loss function, we're kind of generating a, a probable uh, sample. So, and what we try to do, we try to sample from this distribution P of X. And uh, we do, we actually, okay, uh, we have this distribution defined. We cannot evaluate the distribution, actually. I mean, we cannot uh, evaluate, oh no. We can do this optimization constant. Uh, yes, yes, okay, that's true. We, we can um, evaluate the uh, density. What we want to do, we, we want to learn to sample. We cannot sample, but we can evaluate, let's say. So, uh, we will try to approximate our distribution with some another distribution QFX, but we will, again, we will not define it explicitly, but instead we will construct a sampler procedure from another distribution, Q of X, which should be similar to P of X. Uh, one question. Uh, why do we want to sample from P distribution? Uh, because, let's say, uh, th this distribution... This is actually our generator. No, it's not our generator, but it's a distribution of uh, textures, let's say. I mean, uh, you have a loss function, and you can think of it as of energy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's say you want to get in there because uh, if you sample from this distribution, you would probably get a this example that ha has a kind high probability than low energy, right? So, uh, okay, it, it is probably okay for us to sample sometimes the bad points, but let's say uh, in this kind of thing, you can insert uh, a temperature in there, like... Sure. Yes, yeah, so it's easy to uh, define a good probability distribution. Of that. So we can say that we try to uh, sample from this distribution. So once again, we will not define uh, approximating distribution explicitly, but we will define it, we will try to construct a generator. So uh, what we'll try to do again, we will uh, write down a KL divergence, basically. Can I ask a question? Okay. If Q is like the process that takes a random uniform noise and then puts in the uh, neural net, or, or not? The sampler from Q is right. It, it takes, uh, okay. it, it is, it's like uh, in uh, variation of the trick thing, like it's a deterministic function that takes uh, would say noise samples and produces a, a very a sample. So you can rewrite Kyle divergence as this, and then uh, using the the parameterization trick, basically you can uh, construct a Monte Carlo estimators from for this term and this term, and this is a constant for uh, constant with respect to the parameters we want to optimize. It's uh, the constant for the distribution P of X, which we don't care, which we don't care. So, yes, and uh, uh, this actually is uh, what we, we were minimizing in texture nets. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, basically, uh, what we were missing is uh, the second term, which will actually uh, correspond to diversity. And uh, it is basically, basically, basically entropy, yes, <coughs> exactly. So you want to maximize the entropy and minimize the uh, error. And basically for, uh, for entropy, it's uh, not trivial to construct an estimator, but what I found is the uh, uh, nearest neighbors based estimator that looks like that. And uh, basically it says that entropy is proportional to logarithm of uh, clock distances to closest object, right? So... Arseny! I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're here. So this is uh, almost the same problem which we have discussed uh, yesterday. Yeah, I, I can see. So we should uh, take care about this equation, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this, this, this would probably be a correct way to uh, optimize your generator. And it will not collapse. So what, what we did in order to prevent the generator uh, collapsing in our uh, case, um, 
we, we were just defining the uh, structure of a generator in the way that it cannot collapse. So if you, all your transforms are local, kind of convolutions, if, if you transform the current pixel only based on um, a region around it, I mean, like, uh, no, based not on... Okay, let, let, uh, let's uh, discuss another example. Let's say your generator has a fully connected layer. In there. So wh what it will do, it will set all the weights to zero to produce a constant out of all the noise. And then it will try to uh, disentangle uh, the constant into some uh, image that will correspond to a global minimizer of your world. Okay, and if you have uh, some local operations inside your network, then it will not be able to do that. Why? You can put zeros easily, right? But it doesn't converge to that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you can construct it, but it doesn't happen in practice for some reason. Okay. I mean, it's, it's but, but why, why is it less problem than that. in the fully connected case? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really hard to answer, but I mean, it's based on my experience, and this was my logic of not using fully connected layers. And every time I use fully connected layers, it just collapsed to one way. And um, it, it just appears that it's easier to learn uh, zero ways for fully connected layers. Have you Pro seen uh, mini minimize discrimination from dance? Mi mini uh, oh, yeah, okay. But it was like half a year after. <laughs> My experience. Okay. That's true. And I, I was thinking something about about something like that uh, for texture networks, but uh, it would be too, too ugly to use, you know, L2 between uh, the samples. And basically, this is a clever solution, probably, because it's mathematically convenient. Okay, but uh, I've never tried it for uh, texture sen uh, synthesis and stylization, but it's just my, I don't know, future work or whatever, if I would try to improve. So, yes. and uh, the last thing I just wanted to show you is uh, how you are do this video stylization. So, you can do it, for example, frame by frame, yes, but uh, the, uh, the result will be quite shaky. And uh, some people do not like it. What about graphical models and linear dynamic systems? Well, you can do that, but uh, <laughs> I, I, it will be slow. Uh, it will be slow, slower. So uh, the easiest solution, I mean, in, in here I show the optimization-based method. I mean, you, you can apply a fast method with the generating network, but uh, in, in this case, uh, each, each frame was processed by optimization. So you can do it uh, separately. In fact, the problem is this shakiness. So how to do better? Uh, use optical flow. So what is optical flow? Let's say you have two frames and you know that the cup goes right to the right and uh, this box goes to the left and then the optical flow is kind of this vector field that for every pixel establishes the direction of moving, where it moves. So how to use it? Uh, you have your frames. You start, and you can calculate the optical flow between each pair of frames. Then uh, you stylize <laughs> the first frame as you want. You start from random noise. And then, to, in order to stylize a second frame, you first apply an optical flow calculated between first and second frame to your stylized image and use that as a uh, starting point instead of noise. So, uh, in the case that uh, optical flow is uh, absolutely, absolutely great, ideal, then you would probably do not need to do any uh, optimization for your frame two, right? Because you just need to apply your vector field on your stylized image and then you are done and it's already perfect. But then, I mean, optical flow is not that good and uh, so you apply it to your stylized image, use it as a uh, initial point and just optimize for some more iterations. And so on, basically. So again, you calculate uh, the optical flow, apply it to frame two, and then get a frame three, and so on. And uh, it leads to a lot more smoother results. For example, this one. So no shakiness at all. In fact, if you look at uh, his chest, 
the optical fold could not deal with, um, provide a good uh, approximation for the movement in, in there, and so you see that it's quite, quite strange. But in fact it works, and if you look at the ground, it really moves in there, and probably on this example it's uh, more clear, I mean, it, it really moves. So, this is better. And, it, okay, it's uh, optimization based, so again you see some uh, regions that are not stylized or are badly stylized. So, yes, and uh, as I know, Artista app, which does the stylization of the video, it uses uh, optical flow and some more optimizations in order to uh, video to be stable. Oh yeah, and uh, I just, so th this is uh, all I have with the stylization and I just want to, to mention the work of uh, my friend from uh, Skulltech, so it's Yurosal Gunning and uh, Viktor Lenkinski mainly. Uh, <laughs> what problem do you usually have is that when you uh, talk by Skype with another guy, you, you, you look at the center of the screen while uh, he looks at you from the camera and you should, in order to look at his eyes, you need to look at the camera and uh, ideally you want to look whatever, wh wherever you look but your eyes should be corrected like you uh, look at the camera and uh, for that you need to be able to change the direction of uh, gaze so they basically uh, collected a data set of uh, gaze movements and uh, gaze directions and learn the network to transfer the gaze. Like, they can move your gaze direction like five, 15 degrees to the right, to the left and so on. And that is basically the example. So it really works good. Even for you know, Van Gogh and Mona Lisa, which apparently were not in the trainings. <laughs> so yes, that is it. Uh, questions? Uh, how do you deal with the different size of your content image, uh, texture image? Uh, because uh, you have a VGG, which is which has some standard input and should use it for for an arbitrary size image. Um, but you can apply convolutions uh, for any uh, size of image, right? Because I mean, uh, you have a, some specific input size for VGG because of fully connected. Layers. But if you slice off the fully connected layers, you can apply the convolutions to any sized image, right? Okay, but if you use your generator network, it has as an input the, the particular yeah. size. Yeah, while training, it has an input of size like 256 by 256. But when it's trained, since uh, the generator is fully con convolutional architecture, then you can apply it to image of any size. Ah, okay. Of course, it will uh, treat your image as of kind of 256 by 256 uh, images. I mean, but stack, you know. I mean, it, it will not change the uh, the scale of the textures. It, it learned to to generate a particular sized uh, elements like a flower of this size. If you feel <coughs> a greater image as an input, the flower will still be of that size. It will not scale with the image scale. Any more questions? Uh, I think that if you know how this uh, fast video stylization works, I didn't get it. So, how can you do this in stylization trick within your fast framework? Um, well, I think uh, at least you can ask uh, Daniel, who, okay. who worked in Mail probably, but he will not answer you because it's a secret. And <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. You know, I know. Okay. But I, can, I, I cannot tell you. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Again, again what, what was the question? So how can you apply uh, this initialization and optimization? Well, uh, three, so as I know, fast that they didn't fast use uh, Probably because you may just not apply optical flow tweak. You may just um, uh, use very correlated uh, random noise from frame to frame. For example, when your <laughs> random variable moves slowly in the, the space. Yeah, uh, well, no, that, that's this is quite obvious. What I did for ICML demo. Uh, 
how can I start videos or see? Okay, can you just uh, start them? I don't know in the background. So, uh, so what I described it was used for optimization method. Probably fast stylization. It, it, it is really tricky to apply uh, optical flow trick, and they used something different as I know. At least the part. I mean. I'm not sure about all the details, uh, but as I know, the main part was different. But still, you probably can uh, use an optical flow just by... Um, Dimitri, which one? Uh, you can start any, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, quite good. Oh, this is just... Okay, this is an example of uh, video stylization, uh, fast video stylization. And uh, uh, it was done here, it, I mean, the optical flow was used only at testing stage. I mean, while training you do not use uh, optical flow, but when, when testing, you just, uh, you just start from uh, optical flow at the end of life. Oh, okay, no, I'm not correct, actually. What, what he did... Um, it, it, uh, he used uh, the fast uh, version of uh, the algorithm, but it was not me who was generating this image, uh, video. So you can style as uh, a current image and then kind of add it with uh, some small weight to your next image. So it will start, uh, work as a kind of uh, good initializing point. In initializing. So you will have like three losses? No, 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 <coughs> it's not at the training time. So. Uh, at testing time, you pr uh, you process your first image independently, for right, you get the output. Then, for processing the second frame, instead of processing uh, starting from the second frame, you start from the second frame plus like 0 0.05 times the previous stylized, and like goes the image, right? Yeah, yes, okay. exactly. So it will work, and this is basically how it works in here, and uh, it generates some s really smooth. Uh, and this is optimization based uh, uh, video uh, video processing based on optical flow. And yeah, you can see some mm -hmm. optical flow defects. But when video do not moves a lot, then it, it really looks good. Hope that this is something what uh, I was the users. <laughs> so, yes, that's all I have. Okay, any more questions? Mm, can you stylize like higher definition images that, for example, VDG Net uses? Than VGG net uses. Yes, so like the input of VGG net it has a fixed dimension, but what if the original image is high definition and we want to. No, 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 no. Once again, it's fixed dimension because of fully connected layers and we are slicing them off, right? Oh. So you can use any type of, any size of image as an input, okay. both for optimization based method, because you never go uh, as deep as uh, mm -hmm. fully connected layers are. Right, so you do not have to preserve the number of features there. And uh, for fast uh, method, again, you never restrict it to a particular size. You can, again, to compute a gram matrix, you, you need to decide what size of uh, style image you, you use, right? Because the gram matrix are, the size of the gram matrix is independent of what the size of uh, input image. Okay, let us uh, thank the speaker for a very interesting talk and presentation. <laughs> so just to conclude, uh, so here's an example of uh, relatively new area of application.
for machine learning methods. So who would think that machine learning can be used for sterilizing images just several years ago? And now everybody uses it. Uh, probably one could expect that uh, similar techniques will be developed soon for, say, uh, transfer uh, style for texts. For example, when a uh, uh, schoolboy tries to write a composition and, of course, uh, almost all this fails, and then he uses uh, style transfer, and his composition is like uh, the text written by Lev Tolstoy, for example. <laughs> so I think this will be extremely demanded. Yes, yes. <laughs> Don't repeat this mistake with the uh, surprise. Or like, yeah. change your voice on the fly. Yes. Change your voice, for example. Yeah. Uh, one more example. Uh, and what's interesting is, and it was unexpected for me at least, that uh, this is another example of convergence of probabilistic techniques with deep learning. Because here we, uh, we deal with a uh, nonlinear transformation of a random uh, variable. So we start from random noise, and then we transform it somehow uh, with using sophisticated nonlinear transformations in order to get something extremely interpretable. So, and again, the same framework, the same parameterization tweak, the same KL diversions. So uh, the, the mathematical framework is, 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 is pretty similar. Although this is not neural based. But this is again a convergence of probabilistic techniques with deep learning. And this is well, quite interesting and it's very nice that uh, uh, other groups start, start, start using... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, in a week our next speak will be Vladimir... Uh, no, in two weeks. In two weeks? Okay, who is, who is the next speaker? Uh, nobody. Okay, well, I will announce him later because I, I, I just don't remember. Some, somebody scheduled. Probably somebody who is, who is, who is absent today. Uh, according to the schedule, it was about mean uh, something discrepancy. Watch a some, Yeah. Ah, then watch a horror. And watch a horror is, is, is absent today. So this is why we do not know our next speaker.